United States Army. It's been around for quite a while. Fact is, if it hadn't been around, the United States wouldn't be here either. It took some doing. Since 1775, the United States Army has been defending and protecting our nation. That's been the basic mission. And it will continue to be. So it's only natural that when you think of the Army, you think of fighting men. Soldiers have gone on to serve their country as presidents, statesmen, college presidents, businessmen, and in many other capacities. The American soldier is the best trained in the world. And we've seen the combat role in countless movies, books, and television shows. But there's another important side to the Army, and that's what this film is all about. The story of the contributions made to American life and progress, and to the world at large, by and through the Army is one we can only touch on in the time we have. Here then is a glimpse of what has been for the United States Army two centuries of service. A highway follows the course of a river through the mountains. We drive it easily, comfortably, cushioned on foam and secure from heat, cold, dust, or rain. The road is smooth, and it connects with hundreds of others that stretch across the continent from coast to coast. That's the way it is for us. But it didn't just happen. President Thomas Jefferson gave an order to two volunteers, Captains Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Find a water route across the continent to the Pacific Ocean. Lewis and Clark started out in May, 1804. Heat, mosquitoes, muscle tearing labor, and uncertainty. There were no road signs. Nobody knew the way. That's what they were there for, to find it. 4,000 miles their route covered, and they averaged seven miles a day. 28 months of exploration, hardship, exposure, determination. More than two years. But in September of 1806, they sent a report to President Jefferson. In obedience to your order, we have penetrated the continent of North America to the Pacific Ocean. This is how it is for us. But it didn't just happen. Somebody mapped out the way. army is still mapping the way. When astronauts landed on the moon, they knew what to look for and where to find it. Working from photos taken by unmanned flights, the army's map makers had created accurate three-dimensional terrain maps of proposed lunar landing areas. Astronauts used these to make hundreds of realistic landing approaches and takeoffs from selected landing sites on the moon before they ever took off for the actual trip. Yeah. 
Years of pioneering and rocketry by the Army had laid the groundwork for our reaching out to the moon. And when at last the astronauts landed, Army lunar maps went with them. Exploration and mapping, searching out and establishing the overland and water routes that made possible a single nation from Atlantic to Pacific. That's one of the historic ways the Army has used its non-combat skills in service to the people. That's one way, but only one. The Army not only found and mapped new ways to get from here to there, it also built them. It helped build such railroads as the Baltimore and Ohio, the New York, New Haven and Hartford, the Boston and Albany lines. And it provided engineering during the building of canals, including the Chesapeake and Ohio. Of course, those canals are mainly sightseeing attractions today, but this one still does plenty of business. That's because it's still the only way to go by ship from the Atlantic to the Pacific without going down around the tip of South America. The Panama Canal had been given up as impossible a number of times. The United States Army took on the job. Army men had always known how to dig a trench, but this was something else. It took about 10 years to complete the job, and one of the main reasons the army succeeded where others had failed was that an army doctor named Walter Reed, working with soldiers who volunteered to risk their lives, isolated the cause and carrier of yellow fever. The army brought this plague of the jungle under control and completed the project, which still stands as one of the most monumental and most useful feats of engineering in all of history. More recently, the Army Corps of Engineers had charge of the American part of another historic project shared with Canada, the creation of the St. Lawrence Seaway. It would be hard to overestimate the value of this project to the nation. In effect, it has made ocean ports of American cities on the shores of the Great Lakes. Now, what I'd like to show you next is something of a treat. Thirty years ago, Signal Corps cameramen just didn't shoot color film in recording field operations. Happily for us, in 1943, they made an exception for some reason and captured for history the full visual flavor of another major army contribution, the building of the Alcan Highway. It was early in World War II. A road link between Alaska and the rest of the United States was needed, and it was needed fast. Army planners worked out how to get it done and what materials it would take. And soldiers did the work in shifts through the lengthening daylight of the Alaskan spring and summer. There was a lot of road to build and only one season, eight months of the outside, to do it in. In that single working season, they accomplished a near miracle. They put down 1,500 miles of rough but passable road to link Alaska with the 48 states which at that time comprised the nation. Today, the Alcan Highway really is a highway. The man who carved that first rough track through the wild timber would hardly recognize it. But it still does the job for which it was created, providing a vital overland link between Alaska and the rest of the continental United States. And the Army still makes sure it stays in shape to do that job. The fact is, the Army maintains a lot of facilities that we use or benefit from every day, though most people don't realize it. It keeps up more than 28,000 miles of inland and intracoastal waterways. It has built and improved about 500 harbors, 9,000 miles of levees, and some 400 flood control reservoirs. Exploration 
mapping, construction of vital facilities. These are only the beginning of the story. The Army's contributions to medicine and human health are as broad and important as they are little known. An Army doctor wrote the first American textbook on surgery. Another, the first textbook on urology. The first psychiatry textbook. The first book on aviation medicine. The first American pharmacopoeia. They were all written by Army doctors. The Army's well-equipped hospitals are here to serve the citizens who are or have been soldiers. But Army medical research serves every citizen of every country on Earth. The examples are so many, it's hard to know where to begin. We could start right here, for example. Drinking water, here and wherever you are, is most often kept free of harmful bacteria by using liquid chlorine. An Army major originated the idea. In 1944, a young army doctor named Jonas Salk, with his colleague, Dr. Thomas Francis, developed influenza vaccines that provide immunity for several months. And studies done at the Army Medical Research Laboratory resulted in adenine, which doubled the storage life of whole blood for transfusions. Somebody had to be the first to use the X-ray as a tool for diagnosis to prove how useful it could be. Right, the army. And it's still going on. The work, the research, the study. Army doctors looking for better ways to ensure the health and well-being of people. Oh, not just people in uniform. People, people in need whoever and wherever they are. But you know, human needs can take many forms. For example, it's 5.14 in the morning, April 18th, 1906. Still dark in San Francisco. The San Francisco earthquake, hundreds were killed. Fire leveled four square miles of prosperous city to the ground. No fresh food supplies, contaminated water. The army loaded its mules. It brought medical supplies, food, shelter. For two weeks, the army fed nearly 300,000 people a day. And it stayed until the city was back on its feet. The army was there to help in 1906. And it's been there in time of disaster whenever and wherever it is struck. In 1964, the Earth's crust beneath the Sea of Alaska buckled and heaved and shook people into a world of chaos and terror. This time, the Army moved even more quickly. They weren't held to the speed of a column of pack mules. Soldiers and civilians together hurried to help, to reestablish communications, find and care for the injured and homeless, locate shelter for them and get them to it, set up distribution points for purified water and field kitchens for those whose homes have been broken apart like matchboxes. And the Army's rescue role hasn't been confined to the United States. South America, Africa, Greece. Today's Army can reach just about any spot on Earth within hours. And over and over, in recent years, it has done just that. Flying in an evacuation hospital here, airlifting food and medical supplies there, finding out what the needs are, and doing what it can to help. The Army has been involved in so many missions of rescue, relief, and civil defense, that to list them would get monotonous, except perhaps to those hundreds of thousands of people who were there, who remember a time when flood or earthquake, or tornado, or explosion, tore their world apart, and they needed help. And the help was there.
Just in another important way the Army has contributed to the quality of our national life has been in terms of technology. You know, most of the technological advances in all of human history have been made in this century. Flight, for example. The first airplane sold by the Wright brothers was bought by the United States Army. It was co-piloted during its first official flights at Fort Myer, Virginia, by a young Army lieutenant named Lam. The pilot, Orville Wright. The year, 1908. The first Army airplane met all specifications and set world records. It flew 10 miles across country. So I guess you could say that military aviation in America began here with the Army's first purchase. Even today, the Army is still pioneering in aviation, in the design and use of helicopters, a branch of aviation that is growing in importance. What about the Army's human contributions? People to people, now, today. Maybe the best illustration of this, because examples can be found in any community, anywhere across the country, is what the men of the Army Reserve and National Guard are doing. On weekends, for example, reservists of a medical unit may volunteer their time and their skills to help in community hospitals assisting the overworked staff of clinics in providing inoculations, or working in the emergency room, giving of themselves and their know-how to the community they live in, or men of a National Guard unit may organize and lead work groups in a community environmental project, cleaning up a local stream or stretch of shoreline working to preserve or restore the endangered beauty of natural settings. A transportation unit may provide the means for the Boy Scouts of their community to collect and deliver the recyclable materials they've collected. Or an engineer unit may put its skills to work building or repairing day camp or country camp facilities for disadvantaged children of the community. These projects also underline a statement these men make by the uniform they wear, that their business and their commitment is service to the people and the nation. But this kind of direct service to the people of the community is not limited to the men of the Army Reserve and National Guard. We'd like to show you something of a continuing mission of mercy called MAST. That's correct three miles south of the turnoff. Two injured, one not conscious, head injuries, and maybe internal. The other one, it looks like, has a broken arm and a collarbone. No, only one car involved. A couple of witnesses said a blowout. Right, request mass services, I'll stand by. MAST stands for Military Assistance to Safety and Traffic. Its business is saving lives. One of the several installations in the United States where MAST is in operation is Fort Sam Houston, Texas. It's a joint undertaking by the Department of Transportation, HEW, and the Armed Services. 24 hours a day, a primary crew is on alert at MAST operations, with a second crew on call. An auto accident, a hunting or climbing accident, avalanches, floods, premature births in remote locations. Anything that happens to people that requires they be brought to a hospital fast. This is the reason the MAST services exist. The MAST helicopters can range anywhere within a hundred nautical miles of their base. And the crews are highly trained to deal with medical emergencies. Most crew members have flown medical rescue operations in Vietnam. Even in open country, the air ambulance of mass can get to the scene faster and more directly than ground transport. And in mountainous or other inaccessible areas, their life-saving ability becomes even more important. On a sunlit day or in pitch black night, the rescue teams of mass can be on the scene in minutes, ready to put their skill and training to work to help people who need help and need it right away. 
Since it began in 1970, MAST has been instrumental in the saving of scores of lives, from the victims of highway accidents to stranded mountain climbers, from infants suddenly taken ill and needing emergency hospital care, to victims of flood, avalanche, and tornado. To the men of MAST, it's a job to take satisfaction and pride in, as men do who have something worth doing and do it well. And in this, they join the many generations of American men and women who have worn and now wear an army uniform. It's a long and proud and deservedly respected tradition. And the key word in that tradition is service. You know, it's really not easy to talk about the Army's involvement in the technological advance that has made all our lives easier, healthier, more convenient. Because there's so much you could talk about. If you had a list of all the things the Army's come up with, or done the initial research on, or paid for the development of, well, it would stretch a very long way. So, just to give you an idea, and be a little bit different, let's try a little technological smorgasbord. Now, you may wonder what a musket has to do with technological advance. Well, this musket is different from one that's, say, 10 years older in one important way. You can take any part from this musket, and it will fit any other musket of the same model and manufacture. It sounds so simple. But until the Army bought the idea of standardized parts from Eli Whitney, replacement parts had to be made by hand. Standardized parts. This concept made possible the whole structure of mass production, from Henry Ford's Model T to just about every mechanical device we use today. It all started with an army musket. Now here's another random item. It's a handful of paper. Well, not just paper. There's printing on it. And not just printing, computer printing. The point is, the first electronic computer was the army's ENIAC. And all the electronic computers of today, without which you couldn't land on the moon or even land at a major airport, are direct descendants of ENIAC. All right, what about coffee? <laughs> no, the Army didn't invent coffee. However, it did come up with the process we know as freeze-dry. And coffee is only one of the products available to us all that use this process to provide food items that can be stored almost indefinitely, without refrigeration, and in minimum space. The aerosol spray can. Fix your hair, clean your sink, oil your bike, or wax your shoes, or shave. Everybody knows what one of these is today. Nobody had ever even heard of one when the Army first developed aerosol cans to combat bugs on Pacific Islands in World War II. Now, unless you're an auto mechanic, you may not recognize these items. But millions of them are cutting down on air pollution. Now this is a PCV, positive crankcase ventilation valve. It started life as an army device to enable vehicles to cross streams without getting water up the exhaust system. You know, when I was growing up, a portable radio meant that if you were strong enough, you could pick it up and move it. Well, today, a set the size of a pack of cigarettes is considered bulky. The miniaturization of electronic components and circuits made this possible. And a lot of the pioneering work in this field was done by the Army. Now over here, this is called a thermobuer. A bit of recent Army technology that already has more civilian uses than military. Now, this device sees differences in temperature. The Army developed it to detect enemy troops or vehicles, even in total darkness. And it works fine for that. It also works fine, it turns out, in mining operations, where safety personnel now use this principle to locate dangerous faults in tunnel walls. And it works fine in sea rescue work. It can be used to locate a warm body in the cooler water no matter how pitch black the night. 
The Army also developed this little black box. It weighs about eight pounds. What it does is provide pilots with a warning of possible collision with other aircraft. Big aircraft use a device that weighs about 150 pounds. Now what this new device means is that some 200,000 small private planes can now be a lot safer in the air. Now over here, we have a portable weather observing station. Now this, uh, this particular Army model weighs about 30 pounds. But there's already a civilian version that's 10 pounds lighter. Weather reports may soon be based on a much wider range of information from many additional locations to what this kind of unmanned weather station can do. As I said, these are only a sampling. But they do indicate the variety of ways the technological know-how of the Army provides the basis for improvements in the daily lives of all of us. Defenders in times of conflict and danger, yes. But more, much more as well. Contributors in many ways, as soldiers and as citizens, as men and women, as individuals, proud to claim a place among those who have made of the days and years of the United States Army two centuries of service. <laughs>